<laughs> Good morning. Um, we're at a different space today. Well, with every session, it was already different by the mere uh, topics, lengths, breadths of the topics discussed yesterday. But today we're back in this cozy li library space. Some of you may be familiar with it. Those who came to ADN last year. ADN. <laughs> okay, I am awake. Again, let's try this. Good morning. <laughs> uh, today we're going this, but for this session we're going a bit more casual. Uh, in our sessions, if you follow ADN since last year or even the year before in Singapore, uh, we have a mix bag of formats of presentations, keynotes, forums, and roundtable discussions. But we also try to give space to different ways of working, different ways of presenting, different ways of talking about dramaturgy. And one of the things that we've always tried to do is to include smaller bite sizes uh, presentations and some kind of what we call working group sessions where we will highlight particular topics, focus on one or two questions and we break up into groups to discuss and then we actually have sort of like a mini presentation from these subgroups, these little groups, uh, to tell us about their findings or tell us about the results of their discussion. Today we have a, just a two hour one where it's called Continuing Topics in Dramaturgy. And for the next two hours, what we would like to do is we would like to introduce six speakers. It's a bit of a challenge. We need to make sure we keep track of time, but Having said that, what you say is important and we want to make sure that everyone has the time and the space to speak. Um, the reason why I, I sort of was, am suggesting this kind of format this time around is many of us are new to the field of dramaturgy and yet we are trying to do things. We are beginning to understand it and by understanding it, we are trying new things out and perhaps we don't need quite a bit of time to perhaps just talk about where we are and what we are doing. And today we have six uh, speakers of all kinds of experiences, all kinds of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, fields actually, from theater to dance. Um, I just want to quickly now introduce our six speakers who will present uh, their experiences and their work methods or even some of their ideas on dramaturgy in where they're located. And it's quite exciting because we have people from Indonesia, from Japan, from Hong Kong, from India. So if you could just raise your hands or stand up when I call your name and say hello to everyone. We have with us today Verkinda, all the way from India. Um, Verkin is an independent dance choreographer, uh, but more than that, she's also the artistic director of the Gati Dance Festival, more known as uh, Ignite. Yeah, I'm going to keep this quite brief so that when they talk, they can also then fill in the gaps and tell us what they're doing. And then we have Bilkis Hijaz from Malaysia. Oh, sorry, not Bilkis. <laughs> I just saw your name. I saw it. <laughs> as you can see, I'm still half asleep. Uh, we have Yoshiji Yokoyama. He comes to us with great experience. Uh, and he is currently a dramaturg with the Shizuoka Performing Arts Center. But more than that, he also regularly engages in quite a few international exchange programs. He is also a very active producer. Um, and he will be talking to us about some of the things that he's been up to lately. Yeah? Then we have Janice Poon from Hong Kong. <laughs> Janice uh, is based mainly in theatre but also a, what she calls a cultural practitioner, and pr probably we'll hear a bit about that also later. And she lectures playwriting in the, and is the academic project coordinator at the School of Drama with the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts. Um, she'll probably be telling us a little bit about her program, but also some of the projects that she's involved on a practice level, right, with the Hong Kong art scene. We also have Jay Lee, Hey, it's Jay Lee. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Jay Lee yesterday presented a very interesting paper, and today she'll probably just talk briefly on what else she's involved with. Uh, Jay Lee is a dramaturg from Seoul, and she uh, has been working with the 
a Korean contemporary dance company before this, but now she's with the Department of Dance at this, let me get this right, Song Kyung Ki uh, Wan University in Korea. Right. Uh, we have also Ta uh, then Taufik Dawis from Indonesia. <laughs> Taufik comes from Bandung, whose base or, or background was in theatre, but he has already now gone on to curating for the Indonesian Dance Festival. He started some dramatical projects in Bandung, and yesterday, I think, if all of you were here, um, Ugo Prasad, Ugoran Prasad was talking about working on a project with Taufik also. But on his own, he started things in Bandung. And he travels to Jakarta for meetings with the curation team for the Indonesian Dance Festival. Last but not least, we have Kei Saito. <laughs> Kei Saito comes, from us, comes to us from Japan also. Um, and he's with the Bird Theatre Company and also a producer. And he'll be talking about his experience producing and then the role of dramaturgy and dramaturging in what he does. Now, we're going to keep this quite casual. So we haven't sorted out the order of who's coming up to speak. So I'm going to actually say, would anyone like to volunteer to start us off? Thank you, Janice. Thank you so much. So after speaking, I can just uh, sit back and relax and hear the rest of it. That's my strategy. <laughs> Have you seen that? I'm just going to counter by saying she can sit back, but there is a Q and A, and there's a discussion open to the public. <laughs> <laughs> uh, remind me of the time if I'm over. Sure, no problem. But I'll keep it short. Okay. Uh, uh, so the brief introduction. I'm now teaching playwriting at the uh, Hong Kong Academy for Performing Arts. I joined them uh, last September, so I'm very new to the faculty. And I practice as a dramaturg and a playwright. Uh, I also direct uh, uh, in like in the past 20 years, something. And so, okay, uh, I first um, get to know or encounter dramaturgy when I was uh, uh, working in a theatre company called uh, Theatre Ensemble, the later PIP Theatre. Uh, the theatre company closed down already, so... <laughs> Hopefully, it's not about my dramaturgy, but uh, yeah. So, so that's my first encounter of dramaturgy, and it's uh, dated back in two thousand and six. And I, uh, I established a literary department uh, for the company, and it, this is, uh, um, and that is the first uh, literary department in Hong Kong theatre history. And I learned, uh, I, I learned uh, dramaturgy or. Uh, uh, the establishment of the department uh, from a Chinese dramaturg. Uh, his name is uh, Lin Ke Huan. Uh, maybe some of you know him. Uh, I I learned a lot from him, and so so the first uh, encounter is really based on his practice in China, which he enrolled as a literary consultant. That's how they called it, Wan Sui Gu Wen. So um, uh, he worked in, in the youth, uh, National Youth uh, Theatre Company in Beijing. So um, I established uh, the literary department for the theatre company back then in 2006. And I worked there for uh, two, uh, two, three more years. And uh, uh, during that period, uh, well, if you, th if you think marketing is broadening uh, your audience or your spectators, uh, so the literary department is doing something that's deepening the artistry of the company. And so uh, some of the, uh, the uh, scope of work that I involved uh, include um, uh, uh, dramaturgy in their productions and also um, uh, position positioning of the company in terms of the theatre field in Hong Kong and uh, I also involved in archiving and publication as well. And so that's briefly uh, my scope of work and, and I have a name in the company, they all, they all call me the encyclopedia in the company. 
<laughs> because whenever they have a problem or a, a, a question, and they will come up to me, and then I, as if I have to give them an answer. So that's how I work in the company. And then later on, I um, I work as a freelancer, a, a freelance dramaturg and a playwright. Uh, and before that, well, actually before becoming a, a full-time uh, artist in the theater field, I work as a cultural journalist. So I'm not sure if my practice as a dramaturg is was influenced by my journalistic uh, background, but uh, I took a, a, or I take a dramaturgical approach in the projects I involved uh, based on the following uh, uh, items. So the first thing is that um, uh, when I am a dramaturg for a project or a production, I uh, what the first uh, 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 the first uh, response or the first mission that I gave to myself is to enhance the production team's uh, knowledge and understanding of the topic through research, interviews, and text analysis. That's the uh, primary mission that I gave to myself. And second is contextualizing the creative materials. Third is um, develop discourse for social intervention. And the fourth one, uh, because I'm a playwright, so usually I involve in writing or composing the performance text of if I'm involved in the production. And all these, um, like the, these four, four points, these four areas, um, uh, uh, continue in my practice as a dramaturg, uh, no matter whether I'm a company dramaturg or whether I'm involved in the production or other projects that I'm going to introduce later on. Um, uh, well, these are some of the uh, production photographs uh, that, that just keep you awake. <laughs> and then, um, so uh, because I'm a playwright, so, uh, and I, I'm a director as well, so uh, in my own production, I work as my, my own dramaturg. I dramatize, I dramaturging myself. And I can share uh, a little bit more about that uh, uh, later on if there is time. And then the third thing I want to share is um, we talked, we, we, I heard a lot about what is dramaturg or what is dramaturgy uh, yesterday. And uh, uh, when I, uh, I remember when I first traveled to the US uh, like in seven or eight years ago, I always hear people who's involved or work as a dramaturg, they describe themselves as, just that, as the defender or they speak for the playwrights. So what it means is that they work with playwrights most of the time, and, and they are not working as those European thinking uh, mm -hmm. on productions and involving in like constructing the structure and you know other aspects in the production. So, so they really speak for the playwright, especially when they're absent in the re rehearsal room. And when, when I was in London, uh, well, I uh, encounter a lot of dramaturgs. They also work on play development, and they work uh, closely with playwrights. And and then uh, some of them, because they work with European uh, theatre companies as well, and so they they started uh, uh, to work with um, the composition of uh, production of theatre productions or dance productions. And so so you can see there 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 might be a geographical. Uh, differences in the understanding of how a dramaturg works, uh, even in Western countries. And so, um, whenever I identify myself as a dramaturg in a project or a production or a position, um, I will uh, find myself um, involved in shaping the content or the composition of the project. What I mean is that, like, say, for example, if you want me to or engage me as a uh, to research for production, say, for example, so you can, I, I'm happy that you call me a researcher, okay? Or if you uh, want to engage me to uh, give a text analysis of a classical play, say, for example, I, I'm very happy that you name me as a literary consultant. So when I find myself, or when I find myself in a position as a dramaturg in a project or a production, I, uh, I, I know that I'm shaping that project or the production uh, by contextualizing, by developing the discourse, by uh, relating the contemporaneity of the production, and also uh, uh, giving input on the artistry of the project or the production, and especially why here and now. 
Um, so these are some of the uh, reflections of my practice. And last but not the least, uh, I want to introduce um, the latest project that I worked in Hong Kong. It's a three-year project that I um, cura co-curated with my colleagues at West Kowloon. Uh, so uh, you, you, know, you might be very familiar with uh, some of them, but how, how can I uh, trans change to the pub? Uh, so uh, I co-curated this three-year project with Ki Hong, you, uh, many of you know him. He's the head of theatre in West Kowloon Cultural District in Hong Kong, and also Anna Chen, who's the uh, head of dance in uh, West Kowloon Cultural District as well. And so it's a three-year project that uh, we are going to um, uh, basically focus on the practicum of uh, dramaturgy. On the first year, that is which, which is going to happen very soon in March, so this year is the first year. Uh, in March, we are going to kick off with dance dramaturgy. So if uh, we involve, uh, this is not my, uh, uh, is the <laughs> I just want to show you the uh, the yeah the, the website um, the front page of the website. So when you click uh, to West Kowloon's website, then you identify you can find information on this page. Uh, so this year we fo uh, first uh, in March we are going to have a dance dramaturgy workshop uh, conducted by uh, Fu Quan Tan Fu Quan and uh, Arco Renz. Uh, some of you know them. And then in July we are going to invite uh, the head of dramaturgy in Chabonnet in Berlin. So he's going to give us a, a week long workshop on uh, adaptation of classics. And then uh, in October, we're going to invite uh, Stefan, uh, who's the dramaturg of Milo Rao. Uh, some of you might know him. Um, uh, a very uh, sought after European director uh, at the moment. So uh, this year, we focus on production dramaturgy. And, and we're going to uh, conduct workshops, uh, inviting these masters to come to Hong Kong. And so you're all welcome to join the workshops. It's conducted in English. And then the second year, we will continue this practicum um, workshop uh, uh, content uh, and by inviting different, I mean, um, different uh, dramaturgs uh, whose uh, experience in festival dramaturgy and also uh, working as a company dramaturg. And then on the third year, we are going to invite uh, practitioners who's involved or take, uh, talk those workshops in the first two years to submit their proposal on, on uh, involving a dramaturg to work with them. And so we, are, we will invite uh, some of those masters to come back to Hong Kong and be their mentors on their projects. So a very brief introduction, and you can find uh, more information on the website. So that's my presentation. Wow, thank you. Thank thank you. So much. I think what we'll do is we'll just reserve discussions and comments and questions to after we've heard from everyone. Uh, who would like to go next, please? Thank you, Virgin. While they're setting up, I just want to make a, a slight uh, observation. Um, there was a, a point that you made just now about uh, some of the sort of... Uh, uh, checklist that you have in terms of as dramaturg when you work on a project and what was something to do with social intervention, right? Um, is this something that you think is currently developing in Hong Kong itself? This, this, this idea of involving some kind of social issue and theme largely in Hong Kong? Yeah. Uh, it's not necessary. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's how I identify my work. So it is your own Sort of your own checklist. Okay. Yes, yes. But by contextualizing and by concerning the contemporaneity of a production or a project, uh, for me, it's um, to a certain extent you can't escape from social intervention. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Ready? Great. Hello. Hello. Morning. Morning. Hi, my name is Virkin. Uh, not working, just saying. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm actually going to give you lots of images because I don't like words very much. But uh, essentially, I some of you might know this, but I trained as an architect, so I'm not coming from any kind of training in either 
I did have training in dance for a long time, uh, from traditional on to contemporary as well, with some amount of jazz and ballet in the middle. But um, what it really came to while I was still in university was this very interesting mix of uh, where some of my processes within dance making or even being on stage were uh, getting utilized in the way I used to design. Um, and similarly, I sort of found ways to do it the other way around, and I find that quite interesting, even at the moment, and defines a lot of how I do things. Um, so just, I mean, I love the idea of um, the space being a very central uh, sort of aspect of uh, how things transform. So this is actually the same space on the same day. Um, <laughs> so this took about six days to create. Um, the experience was actually quite a crazy mix of food that came along with the space. So the idea was to go through a food lab that um, went, through the, went through many different things. And it became that. This is actually at the Gertrude Institute in Delhi. Yeah. Um, because of the topic that we're talking about today, I thought I'll start with something that I imagined to be uh, what I define dramaturgy as. It's not a word that we use very often. It's also a field that's pretty much non-existent in India at the moment. People might tra be dramaturging, but it's not what they call themselves. Um, but if I, because I wanted to put words to what I thought is dramaturgy, this is what I've gotten to. And I think for me it's pretty much designing an experience where the experience itself could be many different things. Mm. And um, so I imagine it because essentially when you, when you make something, it is for somebody else to consume. Um, and I feel that it's quite important, especially in the context of India, because we, uh, it's quite easy, even with the large expanse of it, to remain in our little silos. And we get quite comfortable in it very quickly. It's the human way to do things. But it's quite important to constantly uh, reach out and um, sort of see where you are and if you're any way relevant to the context or not. Um, I also took the liberty to uh, ask some of my colleagues in India to share what they thought uh, a dramaturg should do. And I think it was more of what we've already spoken of, you know, the idea of a sounding board, a collaborator, somebody who questions them at every point. Uh, but at the same time, I think I realized that these weren't, uh, these are not things that they do as a separate entity. You know, there's, it's the choreographer, it's the director, it's sometimes a lighting designer, it's also somebody who photographs you from the outside a lot of times. Um, so it's been an interesting mix where it's not one person who does this as a separate job and they're not hired to do this as a dramaturg, but it's essentially a friend that you call to be an outside eye. Um, and I think it's, it's really the formality of, um, in India at the moment, we, we're still quite nascent at the age of producing and making work in the way we do elsewhere. So when I want to create a work, it's pretty much me, myself, and my set of people that start this. And then sure, okay, I go over a period of time and I say, this is how I want to do it, and I bring people on as collaborators. So it is pretty much a collective effort and not uh, based on a hierarchical uh, system of I am the director, you are the dramaturg or the dancer. Um, it is quite collaborative and it is increasingly getting more. Um, just as an example, this was a show that was about two years ago. Uh, we started off as um, something from the Natya Shastra actually, and it was the Ashtanayaka, which is the eight women in love. And it describes um, these eight kinds of women and what they do and behave as uh, when they were in love. Uh, <laughs> um, even though it started from here, and uh, it actually went on to something which was completely different. Uh, we completely got rid of the idea of the Ashtanayaka and went on to just realizing that this was such a, I mean, we're sort of still, even though the, the text is 200 years old, um, sorry, 2000 years old, we're still sort of at a point where we haven't gotten over some of those roles. Um, and we really went on to just taking the body of uh, the female body as a point. Uh, we went on to 
a lot of research from both our personal lives of uh, the eight women. We also became seven by the end of it. But, um, and also what the context of the body in public sphere was at that moment. Um, and what was quite important for us was to one, um, show that there were all of these different kinds of bodies, but at the same time, it transforms into something where you really completely sort of take it away from all its, all its sort of straight jacketness and the fact that you have to be like this or not, and it sort of went into a completely different sort of framework where the plain white surface became fully dirty. <laughs> But I think one of the important parts, when, and it sort of plays through everything that we do, is to share the process. So in this, if you, I don't really have an image which uh, sort of talks about it too much. But at the back, what we did was to share each and every process of each and every person in the show as an exhibition after. So you essentially walk into the performance space at the end of the show. Um, and the edge of it, which also became the back backdrop for the performance, has has um, certain parts of what people were engaged in. So it may be text, images, blah, blah, blah. So essentially, it was to bring people into the process in some way or the other. And I think that's always quite relevant. Um, I'm going to quickly go through this. This, um, tell me if I'm going to wrong. <laughs> So I think the other ways on which we, I imagine, have been involved in the idea or the process of dramaturgy is um, one, of course, in the process of creating something new. Uh, but then there are these all these other sort of chance moments which I've come about, which is either curating a dance festival or creating a space which now exists in Delhi for the past one and a half years, which used to exist like this, but is now something called the Odd Bird Theatre. Um, and a black box theater, the only one of its kind in Delhi. Uh, it's also the only curated space. It's quite unusual for uh, a lot of people when I tell them that there are about, we did a research some time ago at Gati, which was to map out infrastructure for dance in Delhi in particular. And we found 235 spaces across um, performance, rehearsal, um, some want of educational institutions, some that weren't necessarily open to the public, was only for themselves, but there were 235, um, of which almost 98% were either defunct or were not used for the purpose that they were created for. Um, and they were all commercial spaces. So if I was to be, if I want to show my work in Delhi at the moment, I have two options. I either, until Lord Bird, by the way, uh, I had two options. I would either go on to a prasindhya auditorium, which generally would range from anywhere between uh, 230-seater to 1,000, um, and I have to hire it at a cost, which is upfront. Um, the other is for me to be in a studio that I am, and the maximum number of people I could probably fit in there is about 50. So that's sort of the large gap between the two, and we found a place where um, where it was very difficult uh, in the sort of non-existent state support structure that India has uh, to have enough artists share their work in the center of Delhi, which is where all the cultural spaces and institutions uh, lie, um, with this large upfront cost which hasn't quite existed ever. So unless and until there's somebody who has decided to support the creation of a work and not just its dissemination over a period of time, would be very difficult um, to sort of get that on board. Uh, the way we work at the theater now is a revenue share model on tickets. It's also very, very unusual. It's very different between Delhi and Bombay. Bombay has a lot more culture of paying to watch performance, which doesn't exist in Delhi, and has. we've taken quite a long time in getting to that point. Uh, so people actually quite uh, uh, don't really think that this is necessary. There are guest lists everywhere and things like that. So the invitation or the culture of invitation to a performance sort of remains very elitist in its manner of who the culture is for. Um, so one, of course, we wanted to move away from the center, which also felt um, sort of politically decentralizing what we imagine as should be the core of the city and who should have access to the center because very few people who actually live in the city live in the center. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, and also the fact that we needed to engage people beyond just the performance itself. 
Um, these are just images from the last four editions of uh, Ignite, which is the festival of contemporary dance that we run. Um, I do want to clarify that when we say contemporary dance, it's not, um, it's not something that we uh, put as a category, but it's really a lens for us to look through as dance practice in India. Um, the idea for us when we started was because there was absolutely no infrastructure, either to disseminate the shows or to, uh, or to have a conversation around that. Um, so it has been quite interesting and quite a quick journey to where we are now, and we find ourselves quite uh, um, at a point where we want to question even the fact of how we presented all of it. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, wait, I'm going to do this last one. Uh, this is the latest ideas, I must say. It's not really a project at the moment, but it's an idea. <laughs> um, is what I sort of term as uh, borrowing some language from the tech world and an arts accelerator program that I'd like to set up, which is um, essentially contains three things, uh, a touring circuit within the country, which is actually quite difficult. Um, it's quite easy for me to get international work to come in through all the embassies and support that we have of international agencies, but it's quite difficult for us to move within the country. It seems weird, but it is. Um, also, what we all do, and I find that to be a pretty relevant space at the moment in India, is the role of the creative producer, curator, designer, dramaturg, whatever you want to call it. I don't have a word for it yet. But um, to be able to upskill them to a certain point where there is the ability to self-start and create your own. Um, and in the long term, an investment channel which I can bring in as a collective pool of um, resources uh, to be able to channel it into things what we imagine to be relevant. So yeah. Thank you very much. Right, swiftly moving on. Swiftly moving on. Tafik, would you like to? So Tafik has uh, asked Linda to kindly help us uh, translate. So Tafik will be speaking in Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, and Linda will help to interpret, and I will try to help support that interpretation. Before I want to ask your permissions to help Tofik in translations with my baby English. <laughs> Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, Langsung aja. Uh, tadinya saya akan presentasi pakai bahasa Inggris yang sudah saya terjemahin. Well, he actually preparing the English text uh, to present in this uh, session. Tapi karena terlalu literal. But it's because just because it's too literal. Saya khawatir malah akan membuat tidak mengerti. <laughs> He is, and then uh, he felt that he uh, afraid to deliver it uh, just to make people confused. Jadi saya akan pakai bahasa Indonesia. So he preferred to use Indonesian language in this presentation. Uh, saya akan mempresentasikan uh, kerja dramaturgi saya di Bandung, terutama di Bandung Performing Forum. I would like to I would like to uh, pre presenting the works that I've. Uh, that I've been doing in Bandung, it's called Bandung, Bandung Performing Art Forum. Bandung Performing Art Forum. Dua tahun terakhir ini. Within this two year. Uh, tapi melalui studi kasus uh, proyek terakhir, yaitu memberi ingatan. And he wants to bring three uh, examples of the chapters. Uh, once is uh, memberi ingatan. How do you call it? The buying the memory? Literally, it means to buy memory. To, bu buy, to, buy, to buy memory. To buy. Membeli hingga ke tangan. Membeli. Membeli, ya. Yeah. Uh, tapi sebelum itu, saya akan jelaskan sedikit mengenai uh, aspek dasar yang kami kerjakan di BPAF. But before he going further to the details, he wants to give our, uh, he has a, a brief uh, description about um, BAF, the BPAF. BPAM, the Bandung Performing Art Project. Uh, setiap patrik dramaturgi di BPAF pada dasarnya adalah usaha menemukan dan menghubungkan mata rantai seni pertunjukan dengan medan yang tengah berlangsung. 
Medan apapun itu. Basically, the BAF starting to trying to uh, find out the chains of the performing art in Bandung and also connected it with the um, a social uh, spheres around it. Karena kami percaya uh, Medan itu adalah Medan yang mengantarkan kami juga ke me, uh, Medan yang lain. Because we believe that uh, those spheres is also the spheres when we can connect to other sphere. Konteks lain dan gagasan yang lain. Another context and also uh, another idea. Tapi kami muka investiga investigasi itu melalui pertanyaan di sekitar batas seni dan kehidupan sehari-hari. He departed his idea coming uh, from the uh, questions, uh, the borders between art and then daily life. Apakah ada perbedaan menjadi warga seni dan warga kota? Is there any differences between for beings? Um, perbedaan artists, warga seni menjadi warga kota. Uh, uh, for beings. Uh, Art citizenships and the being uh, city citizenships. Art. Basically, between the difference between an artist and what you call a, a As, regular citizen. Mm -hmm. hmm. Pertanyaan ini menghadirkan tegangan-tegangan pada setiap project Bandung Perfume Art Forum. Tegangan antara sebagai seniman dan sebagai salah satu da dari bagian dari warga. These projects. Um, Our, um, it was also um, emerged some tensions between um, seniman dan sebagai salah satu bagian dari warga between the artists and artists that actually also part of the, uh, the city society dan tegangan sebagai seniman dan uh, seba, uh, dan orang lain sebagai warga penonton and the tensions between someone who becoming artist and also other people who who is also part of the society Tegangan ini tidak hanya berlangsung pada tataran diskursif seperti pada penggalian tema atau isu terkait sumber penciptaan, tapi juga sampai pada tataran teknis atau praktik pertunjukan yaitu pada struktur hubungan antara pemain dan penonton. The tension is not only um, happens in the discursive levels, um, in, in the concepts and the idea, but also in the practical levels, um, the relationships between the, art, the, the artist and also the audience. Uh, saya akan mulai masuk langsung ke pembeli ingatan. Saya akan lewati. He wants to go further to the uh, to buy the memory. Yeah, so this is the one project that you did. It was called pembeli ingatan, ingatan, which is actually to buy a memory, memory or memories, right? Proyek membeli ingatan adalah proyek Teater yang berdasarkan riset saya atas penonton penunjukan dan gaya bahasa dari lima kelompok teater di Bandung. These projects are departed from his research about the audience and also the five uh, particular language language styles of uh, five uh, theater groups in Bandung. Uh, pasca drama, pasca STB. Pas, post post drama, post STB. STB adalah post, post dramatic. Post dramatic. Post the post dramatic. No, no. Pasca drama, jadi sudah tidak lagi menggunakan drama, tidak linear. Tidak linear. So we have to, we, we call it a post dramatic then. Post dramatic then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, STB adalah salah satu. Dia dia lahir uh, tahun 1957. Di Bandung. STB was found in 1957. Uh, in banyak menggunakan naskah terjemahan dan uh, naskah yang dibuat oleh salah satu anggotanya, tapi tetap berbasis drama. Maaf ya, nama penuh STB. Sudikup Theater Bandung. Sudikup Theater Bandung. Sudikup Theater Bandung. That's what he's referring to as STB. STB. Oh, STB. 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 And these groups are uh, mostly working with the. Uh, um, Translated text. text and also uh, the text that's produced by one of the member. Uh, STB uh, punya keyakinan bahwa teater harus uh, membawa nilai-nilai universal. STB believe that theaters have to carry to has to carry on the the values of the uh, humanism, humanism, universal humanism. Mereka. Uh, bilang teater harus memanusiakan manusia. They said that 
Theater harus memanusiakan manusia. <laughs> uh, the literal translation is that theater should humanize humans. Yes. Basically to look at humanity. Hmm. Riset ini bertujuan untuk melihat semacam perkembangan teater di Bandung dalam fungsinya memformasikan identitas kolektif, identitas politis dari kelompok identitas yang tidak diperhitungkan. And the aims of the research is to identify the developments of the theaters in Bandung and also to define the, polit uh, the, the identity formations, the, the political identity formations of the peoples who, who are excluded. Atau identitas sosial yang tidak ter termasuk dalam kategori yang tertata dalam tatanan negara atau wacana dominan. Are the uh, particular identity of the certain community that excluded in um, excluded by the structured um, structured structures by the state and also negara dan negara dulu the, by the state yaitu rezim fasis order baru which is his new orders uh, regime dan rezim pasar and the market regime okay uh, so the market as in the economy and the order baru being the dominant ones and STB would actually talk about the marginalized communities within Bandung is that what you're saying? outside the fringe right? imagine well it, that's actually is what they are doing what uh, STB is doing or what this project this project doing, doing. Okay. pada awalnya project ini adalah riset akademis yang dikerjakan dengan pencarian data yang terbilang sulit Uh, first of all, uh, this um, this research are academic research uh, what, um, that runs upon the archivals. Uh, karena pembuatan database penonton di Bandung, mungkin juga di Indonesia jarang atau bahkan dilakukan pada tahun-tahun 97 sampai 2000-an itu. Just because in Indonesia there is no database of the audience of the performing art within the um, era of 19 97s until 2000 until 2000s so he found the difficulties to access and also collecting the data sementara itu dokumentasi dan pengarsipan penunjukan teater dari segi kualitas dan perawatannya juga masih seadanya and the qualities of the uh, archive maintenance is really poor in indonesia uh, dalam uh, dalam uh, beberapa hilang dan juga beberapa tidak menganggapnya tidak penting Some of them, most of them are gone, just, just disappear, and some of them are uh, like a broken damage. Dalam perjalanannya ketika menemukan subjek yang diwawancarai, karena waktu ya, jarak waktu tunjukan yang jauh tadi, saya selalu memulai pertanyaan kepada penonton yang saya temukan, apa yang paling diingat dari setiap pertunjukan? And when he doing um, interview with the audience of the past performance art, in uh, in 19 um, around 1997 till to, to uh, 2011 and the 2011 just because of the distance of the time so he always asking uh, questions what are you remember the most uh, about the performance jawabannya bisa berupa gambar peristiwa suara benda dan hal-hal lain yang uh, sifatnya sensorik And the, and the answers can be any kind of sensory uh, things like uh, images and sounds or the things that they found or uh, um, the, the materials. Tapi kemudian melalui pertanyaan-pertanyaan selanjutnya, wawancara bisa kemana-mana sampai menghasilkan pemaknaan baru dari apa yang mereka ingat. Bisa merevisi atas pemaknaan sebelumnya dan juga bisa menautkannya dengan topik aktual yang sedang terjadi. But then, uh, after the conversations going for a while, and then uh, they starting to make a longer um, uh, uh, dialogues about the performance that they um, uh, talking about, not only about the, the memory, but also about how to restructureize it, um, uh, the meanings or the uh, or the how do you call it, um, the, the the message that uh, they found uh, uh, in in the performance itself and reconnect it with the uh, actual context. Uh, kemudian wawancara ini saya transkrip di, 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 di tekstualisasi. And then he transcripted uh, the interview. Sementara dalam pencarian dokumentasi video, uh, saya beralih pada uh, 
bagaimana melihat tubuh aktor di setiap pertunjukan. Um, because he found the difficulty to find the video archive, so he turned in, uh, turned in around into the archival bodies of the actors. Yang kemudian membuat saya membayangkan bagaimana situasi produksi setiap pertunjukan dalam menciptakan dan mengartikulasikan kebutuhan uh, art hysteria melalui bahasa artistiknya kepada penonton yang dibayangkan. So uh, in that way he can imagine what kind of productions process that uh, had happens at that times and also how they manage uh, the, the message to deliver it to the audience. Okay, kita lewat. Uh, jadi saya uh, mengajak uh, beberapa ak lima aktor yang di, di yang saya teliti, bukan yang saya teliti, untuk kemudian berkolaborasi di proyek ini. So I invite the five actors that he researched uh, to uh, to collaborate in this project. Uh, dan tiga aktor lain, eh, empat aktor uh, muda yang uh, sedang merumuskan praktek dia saat ini, praktek perkesenian dia saat ini. And he also invite uh, four young actors to be involved uh, in this project as a, as a process to for them to grow and also to uh, identify their practices and to develop their practices. Jadi ada perubahan dari awalnya adalah proyek tekstual, akademis, ke uh, proyek uh, yang bersifatnya pertunjukan uh, ya, artistik, liveness, dan lain-lain. So there is a transformation from the tech, uh, from the textual academical research into the performative uh, corporeality. Hmm. Per performative corporeality. Jadi uh, uh, saya juga uh, saya juga berusaha menginvestigasi mengintervensi uh, data yang saya peroleh. He also tries to uh, intervene the data that he found dengan uh, apa yang terjadi di Bandung hari-hari ini related to what happens in Bandung uh, for today uh, yaitu uh, latah industri kreatif oh latah the background of uh, creative industry hmm, jadi saya akan membuat sebuah kafe so he will create a cafe uh, kafe ini uh, merebak di Bandung uh, dengan berbagai konsep dan tema yang dijualnya. As a cafe also emerged uh, in Bandung and Bandung has a lot of cafe. Kami kemudian membuat konsep kafe ala kami sendiri dan memberi nama kafe ini Ingatan Cafe. But they uh, but they create cafe by their own uh, things uh, and uh, give its names as a memory cafe. Uh, yang kami buka setiap satu jam, setiap hari, uh, dalam dua hari dengan konsumen yang terbatas maksimal 30 orang dengan sistem reservasi yang berbayar. The cafe are opens uh, two hours every, one hour every two days with the limit with the limit uh, numbers of the people who can come. Cafe ini menawarkan lima menu, lima menu pertunjukan tadi rasanya. This cafe offer to the audience five menu. Dari lima pertunjukan tadi. Uh. Five menus. The menus is the performance itself. Paket. Tapi ada tiga paket, yaitu paket teks, paket tubuh, dan paket teks and tubuh. Uh, with the three special package. <laughs> uh, paket. Paket teks. Uh, text package. Jadi wawancara yang saya tadi. From the from interview, the interviews. Dan paket tubuh. The, uh, the body package. Dan and tubuh dan paket. Dan paket and, 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 complete and, and, paket. A complete paket tax and body. Nah, yang bisa uh, kalian beli lebih murah. That people can buy more cheaper. <laughs> Mereka bisa hanya bisa mengkonsumsi selama lima menit penonton. They only can consume uh, for five minutes long. Tapi bisa dinegosiasikan sama aktor. But the audience also can make negotiations about the durations with the actor. Tapi kalau uh, tidak cukup, kalian bisa membelinya lagi melalui kasir. But if uh, you not feel that it's enough, in, enough, so you can buy it again to the cashier. Uh, tapi kalau ada yang tidak mau beli, kalian bisa menonton pertunjukan gratis di tengah kafe dari lima aktor, eh dari empat aktor dan tapi kebetulan ini tiga aktor yang menceritakan tentang pahit senangnya di 
theater. Bukan itu perjukan gratis. Oke. Okay. Oh, okay. So so they also offer to the audience for having a free package which is about uh, the um, the the narration, the story, the Peter story and fun story. And also fun fun story story of the actors. Ada kaitan juga tidak. Okay. So it becomes a loose thing where there is a bit of association with the three packages that is tied to the historical research, but there's also some elements of which is different and which is completely tangential, it's completely different, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, itu, itu terakhir. Okay. Uh, jadi masalah pasar atau konsumsi yang sebenarnya sedang berlangsung di Bandung bukan menyangkut masalah hanya mengenai kebutuhan tapi juga membentuk subjektivitas kita masing-masing. So uh, about the markets in Bandung that emerge very rapidly is not only about uh, how to consume but also how to uh, f f oh sorry subjektivitas kita masing-masing. How uh, how it also forms uh, the sub the people subjectivity. Pertanyaannya adalah ketika And the is, uh, bagaimana subjektivitas kamu ketika kamu sudah membeli ingatan dari sejarah publik teater yang bisa kamu konsumsi hanya 5 sampai 10 menit. The question is how is your subjectivity after you buy uh, the the histories of the Bandung theaters and that you can consume within 5 minutes. Terima kasih. Thank you. Right, so we have the next one, please. We get it rolling. Questions, Yeah. You have time to prepare? No, but I'm just going to. While your uh, prepares very quickly, I, I, I feel that I need to just help to contextualize very quickly. Uh, Bandung is quite a special city in Java, where they are now at the cusp of this whole creative industry uh, growth. Bandung. Unlike the cities of Jogja or Solo, even Jakarta, Bandung doesn't really have a very strong traditional base. And therefore, there was a call for, by the mayor, right, in the last 10 years to build Bandung into this creative industry hub, where there was a lot of emphasis put on design, uh, on fashion. And lumped up with that, or complicated by that, was then the visual art market. There was a huge, uh, uh, literally an injection of, uh, of cash to literally grow this visual art uh, community in Bandung. And performing arts has always had the uneasy um, position, not knowing where to sit within this creative industry, uh, 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 I guess, f uh, field that the government has created, unlike Jakarta or Solo or Jogja. Yeah, we can talk about that later, but now, over to you, Yoshiji-san. Hi, everyone, Yoshiji. Um, so, uh, at, at first, yeah, I just, just I, I want, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to talk after Taufik, because um, my topic is related to, to, to yours, and also because I, I, I'm so happy to find that I'm not the only one who don't speak well English. <laughs> yeah, and also, I, I'm so, so well prepared. And, um, you know, um, I, I'm uh, very, very sad that I, I couldn't attend uh, other ADN sessions because um, I'm also a board member of OMPAM, Open Network for Performing as Product um, Managers, and that's why I, I was not there uh, yesterday. And also, I didn't get get well the concept of this this <laughs> session, and I don't know that I, I would speak, uh, I would uh, make a lecture like that. So I, I just prepared something this morning, and this PowerPoint is not uh, really for my presentation. <laughs> I, I uh, so she, she, she gave gave you a resume uh, a paper about my presentation, but I have to. Uh, uh, interest my, myself at first, I, I think. So my name is Yoshiji, and I'm um, working for uh, SPAC, Shizuoka Performing Arts Center. Um, and so just uh, yeah, I, I I wanted to sh show that because um, yeah, it's our theater. So look, Shizuoka is nearby uh, the Mount Fuji. Yeah. And, 
uh, it's our main venue, uh, Shizuoka, uh, Shizuoka uh, Theater, uh, and performing arts park. Uh, so we are located in a natural park near Mount Fuji. Uh, we have uh, four venues, and uh, the specialty is the green tea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, uh, we we have two best fishing ports in Shizuoka, <laughs> so you have to come. You know? <laughs> And, and I, I'm uh, working for uh, World Center Festival, so it's just set as well. <laughs> it's also important. And um, uh, so, uh, we have also set up, uh, we, uh, it's a set up festival because uh, we have a set up company. And uh, we presented, um, for example, uh, Mahabharata and the Avignon Festival. And, uh, it's a Japanese version of Mahabharata. <laughs> and, and also, and, uh, this year, uh, we presented uh, Antigone uh, in, the, in, the, in the, op the opening of the Avenue Festival. Uh, so that's a um, kind of context. And also, uh, I didn't prepare anything about that, but uh, for the moment, uh, yeah, uh, since this year, I'm working also for Tokyo Festival. So now I'm a programmer, uh, I'm in charge of international uh, programming uh, for two festivals now. And my question is, so, uh, uh, to, to, uh, you can refer to my paper. So my question is, why it's difficult to uh, program Asian contemporary theater? <laughs> yeah, because, so I, I'm working for two theater festivals, and, and, and every time I try to program Asian productions, and every time, it's very complicated. <laughs> and, and every time, often, uh, I, when I propose a, an Asian contemporary theater production, my colleagues say, oh no, there's no audience for that, or <laughs> it's not so interesting, or something like that. Yeah. So it's quite, yeah, I, I think um, some, of, <laughs> some of you have the same experience, I don't know. So it's uh, easy, much easier to program uh, Western uh, contemporary theater productions than Asian productions. Why? So, and, and so, uh, and my, my background was, uh, you know, uh, my specialty was in the European acting series. Uh, so now, I wanted to share some um, some elements from, from my uh, my research and on um, based on my PhD thesis. Uh, so, uh, but, I, but yeah, I, I cannot talk talk about all my <laughs> all that. But anyway, uh, so I will uh, try to trace a kind of uh, the, the history of uh, European theatre in three minutes. <laughs> kind of, you know, uh, all the here that we, we, we do it in this afternoon, so uh, you can prepare for what we said. Anyway, so, um, um, so my, my specialty was the French theater and French acting series and at, at first, and I found that in the 18th century in France, there were many um, acting, uh, acting series in, in the 18th century. And all that are based on uh, so-called the Roman rhetoric. Do you know what what is? Do, do, do you know what uh, the Roman rhetoric? Yeah, you know <laughs> the rhetoric in the, uh, the ancient Rome, <laughs> uh, like Cicero, Quintilian, etc. But yeah, in, anyway, uh, you know. Um, so it was the main topic in the in the schools and in the 18th century in, in France, and. Uh, the rhetoric is an art uh, to persuade people uh, by words uh, in speaking, you know. And is it like the orator? Orator, yeah, yeah. That's a word. You know, <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's a discipline to uh, to form orators. Uh, so. Uh, uh, because yeah, and, and the, in Europe, it, it was uh, important to, to, to convince people uh, by words, and uh, because in this period, the European education was a very, uh, how I say, an elitist education. It's, it's, it's an education to be a leader. 
So that's why it's important to convince people by, by words. So that's why it, it was the main discipline in, in the European education. So uh, the problem is that so uh, every actor, uh, every modern actor, uh, uh, landed in the school to be an actor. And they, they, uh, so when they uh, write uh, acting theories, they copy the Roman rhetoric theories. And there, you know, the Roman rhetoric is an art to be an orator. So in the kind of, kind of actual lawyer, lawyer, you know. And there, they, they say that you don't have to sing or dance, you know. That's why, you know, uh, the Europeans invented a theater without singing and dancing. Text based, the word was yeah. the most important. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but it's, it's, it's very normal because you, if you want to be a lawyer, you, 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 you cannot sing or dance. <laughs> you know? It's just so, so convincing, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, that, that's the thing. Um, and I mean that, so, so you, you said, uh, Taufik, that the theater has to humanize the human, the human being. And so, in this, in this, uh, so this education is called the humanist education, the humanist education. So why humanist? Why human? Because in, in the ancient, ancient Rome or ancient Greek, the, the, there are uh, there are two, two types of human beings, but there are two, two, type, two types of pe people. There are uh, free men, and there are slaves. Yeah, you know. So, uh, the so-called human, humans, uh, so uh, the, the, the Roman people said uh, humanities, uh, to, 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 uh, that it's, it's a culture, a, a, hum a humanist culture, it, it's a, uh, something you, you have to learn to be human, to, to be a free man, to be a citizen. You know, and and so otherwise you 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 will you you will be a slave. So that's the rhetoric, because if you cannot convince people uh, to be a leader, uh, you 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 will be a slave. That's the point. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I say. Yeah, so that, that's why the modern, uh, yeah, the, the modern actors, so the, the actors in Europe uh, were also uh, in a very uh, complicated situation because they, they, they were also like, like, like slaves. So uh, why, uh, so the, the, the problem is, so uh, the modern actors uh, didn't imitate Roman actors because the Roman actors were slaves, kind of slaves. Because, uh, the, uh, because uh, they, the, the, um, you know, they, uh, they were singing and dancing, and it means that they, they have to sell their body uh, for the pleasure of other people. So that, that's why uh, the modern actors, the modern European actors, uh, wanted to be citizen. <laughs> Uh, that's why they, they didn't imitate Roman actors, but they, they imitate Roman lawyers, <laughs> Roman orators. So it's a kind of beginning of the modern theater in Europe, you know. Yeah, okay. So the, the, the topic is that, you know, uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this scheme, uh, they, they, they are talking a lot about Asian orators who, who, who are dancing and singing. Uh, because in, 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 this, in, the, in, in the ancient Rome, and, and, uh, uh, the, the Asians are, were slaves of Romans or Greeks. That, that's, and th th there are many dancers and singers f from Asia. So that was the image. So uh, now, uh, the the modern, modern European theater is based on this anti-Asian model. <laughs> so that's why um, 
well, uh, for example, when uh, the Japanese, uh, Japanese, contem uh, Japanese modern theater started, um, a Japanese director said, uh, said to the Japanese kabuki actors to, to, to make a modern theater, you don't have to dance, you don't have to sing, you, don't have, to, you, have, to, you have to speak, you have to move <laughs> like citizen. <laughs> So that, that was the beginning of um, Japanese, uh, Japanese modern theater, <laughs> at the beginning of the 18th uh, 20th century. Uh, so we um, still we are not so accustomed to have a kind of an uh, association between Asian theater and and, uh, and the modernity. So yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I stop here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. So basically, the whole your whole thesis is about then the politics of class, yeah. politics of uh, elitism, and how theatre was looked upon as something that was of a lower class, right? Yeah. And then how then that was transformed by using orating or rather the, the, the rhetoric rather than acting compared to Asia where it's always performance. Yeah, so just, just, so, just, just, just one thing to add. Um, yeah. So now, you know, uh, actually, the, uh, the just uh, the economical, uh, the things is, are, are really changing. I, I think you, you, you were feeling that. And uh, uh, so now we, we, ha we have more than more Asian network, uh, as you see here. <laughs> And so that, what, 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 what's changed uh, since 10 years is that uh, we, uh, so before, um, even a a Asian people, uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, so sorry, <laughs> just to, to take it. Um, so now, the, the economical uh, growth uh, changed the world. <laughs> and they, they say that in the, uh, in the 2030s, the economical gravity uh, will, will move to, a a to Asia. So, and, and we have more and more network uh, within Asia. So now we have to make a new framework, you know. And, and but just, just uh, actually, yeah, 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 we have to, we have to uh, say, uh, Reza, that the economical gravity is coming back to Asia. <laughs> because China and India are wars at this, um, uh, center of uh, world, world economy before. <laughs> and so now um, uh, we have to uh, make a new framework of contemporary performing, performing arts uh, uh, with ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ji san Thank you. I think I'm just going to uh, quickly ask Jay Lee, perhaps you both first, and then we end up with uh, Hiro san. So basically, I, I think I, I sort of, I'm quite familiar, a bit familiar with Yoshiji San's work also in the past few years. He has been doing a lot of research looking at the creative industry, the economy, and tying it back to especially Asian performing arts networks. And he has done quite a bit of research into trying to look for new frames of references for networks. And what does it mean to be a network? What does it mean to be a creative producer? What is this term that we add, the, the term of creative being added on to this, this, this position of a creative producer. So if those of you who are interested in continuing this dialogue, please talk to Yoshi-san about this. It's, I think his ongoing really passion and research into these questions for quite a few years already now. And, and there are more questions that have formed, but there are also quite, uh, I would say, interesting theories and, and kind of uh, thinking that you have formulated, yeah? So let's go now to Jay Lee, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jay Lee Kim. Uh, now I'm working as an uh, independent dramaturg and also the, uh, teaching in the university. For my, uh, my class is most like a choreography method or a dramaturg work. So, uh, what level is this at? Sorry. Uh, level. What level? Bachelor's? Oh, it's just a bachelor and master, also PhD okay. degree also. So uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, one of one case of my dramaturgical project. Um, it's uh, I, will, I, will, I have a work uh, 
in co uh, Korea National Contemporary Dance Company, 2014-2015. At the time, it's in the Korean dance field, people's getting interested in kind of different form of choreography opposed to the traditional way to art making. So at the time, we just introducing a lot of research-based choreography and experimental choreography, you know, the lecture performance and every concept is arising to the introducing in the field of dance. So, and at the time, our uh, company just uh, changed the artist director, and the artist director is eager to help making some new, new movement in contemporary dance field. So I'm going to introduce uh, some project to, from the KNCDC. So, um, in the Korean context, uh, over the past decade, many, many projects resulting from the collaboration between the dramaturgs and choreographers. The choreographers are rethinking about the, the art making the, with the, uh, the dramaturgs. So um, it's pretty much uh, influenced from the European, you know, European contemporary dance field. But we just ask about why we need dramaturgy by now. So they think about this in, think about in the context of the Korea, so we just invent, invent the other forms of choreography. So I'm gonna introduce just one project. Mm. When I uh, working in uh, Korea Dance com uh, National Company, they asked me pr present various projects and program. So I have to make new program and I'm researching and um, and to meet the national institution requirement like like new one, it's totally new one, different from the traditional one. So. Uh, they want a breaking from the general dance production method that took place in, the, uh, in favor of a new proposed method of choreography. So I'm gonna uh, talk about one project. This is not about the, the dramaturgs work with just one piece with one choreographer. It's a kind of curatorial dramaturgy, I, I can say. So. My topic is the multiple activities of the dramaturg. Yeah. Uh, I have a project is uh, support the younger generation in dance uh, dance field in Korea. It's the name of the choreographic lab, the choreography laboratory. The, the, the project name is Still Be Choreography. I adopted this name from Pina Bao. She said, Pina Bao says, it's a, uh, there are a lot of dance style in the world. And then you can say, it looks like different from dance, but if you think about, we recognize this dance, still be a dance, yeah? So I, I adopted this concept of the Pina Bao and then I make up the Still Be Choreography. Yeah, it's, it, this is form is like, is this a choreography? But yes, it's a still be choreography. I'm just insisting this is choreography. <laughs> so <laughs> encourage the younger generation can do everything. Yeah, not, not, it's not about whatever. It's more effort to make a new experiment. So, so I make this kind of type of a project. And this is the final presentation. Uh, that woman in black is me. I just explained to how to see and participate to this visual kind of project. So I need to explain to the, or the audience, yeah. And this project is with KNCDC, Korean National Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's from the Korean C, uh, KNCDC program. We, it, the same project, we, we have start from the 2014, 2015, these two years. Yeah, I, I curating this project. They're very different kind of, uh, they introduced a very different kind of 
the concept and practice and uh, the experiment of the choreography, this kind of installation, just to show the just only show the video and the, with the, the all the research, the putting the post it, they just making research, they they just display the, what they research. And the, the place is the uh, where's the backstage of the theater. So there is the choreographer. Is uh, the choreographer's theme is about the city and sinkhole. So all the audience they put it in the head and then the kind of the parkour performance and then go all the, the through the back backstage from the theater. So. Yeah, the kind of the kind of the parkour method choreograph, and then the the man is red. It's a drama trick. It's a wonderful <laughs> drama trick. She, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I mean, he eager to be uh, on the stage always. Yeah, it's a very active drama trick we have. Not so invisible. It's so invisible. Yeah, and but. Very orange. I'm got orange, and and this kind of the participate is just to see the performance like just like a gallery performance. Yeah, it's the same level with the performance, and they stand or sit down, and they kind of uh, it's like a more more than like event. Yeah, correct event rather than just performance in the theater, the black box. Yeah, this is kind of a participatory performance. <laughs> they do a lot of things. And then the, all the audience just follow the, some score and then choreographer just directing them and then they just very, you know, there's a very kind of audience we met. So just like this, everything do, everything do the, what the choreographer wants and then the kind of the participatory performance we showed. Can I just quickly ask, this lab, there'll still be choreography mm -hmm. lab, how long is the period of the lab? It's almost one year. It's one year, so for yeah. 2014, 2015, you have two, two, two different yeah, labs. Two, yeah, yeah. How many people are in one lab? One lab is a seven and or eight choreographers. Seven, eight choreographers mm -hmm. and you lead them and you facilitate. Yeah, yeah I facilitate and as a drama troupe, I facilitate and collaborate and then friend. Sure. Yes. Yeah. How many dramaturgs do you have? Because the, the man in orange is another dramaturg. So yeah. how many dramaturgs do you have working it's with these seven or eight choreographers? We just I I'm pretty much my work is curator curate. Yes. Uh, so we need more dramaturg. So we invite the dramaturg just one. Right. So Outside one is shared like, among. Yeah. Yeah. One is a share with me that we collaborate with the drama yes. to work. And I assume the pictures you're showing us is the public showing, the, mm -hmm. the result of the entire Yeah, event. yeah, okay. yeah. The whole, I just explained the whole, the programs is the choreography lab is a week, uh, the program consists of the lectures and seminars and presentation mm -hmm. and mentoring. Yeah, they kind of uh, consist of the kind of programs. And it's, but I'm pretty much, my position is a drama true. As well. I call them the curatorial drama tree because my work is very, uh, my work, I often interfere the choreography process, it's of them, and I like, I, I'm concerned that all this project or all the research, so um, sometimes in, I met the individual artists or the group work and talk about the, the their research, and then I support, I support the physically, you know, the sometimes very emotionally. There are a lot of choreographers, there are a lot of artists make a very unhealthy human tension in it. So I'm, I'm support this very emotionally. It's, it, this is one of my big job there. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and this is, this is a, the site's specific performance. <laughs> I 
technically. Yeah, we using the place, the whole place, and the theater, the, the aisles and lobbies and the, the stage and the backstage, even the outside the, the theaters. So, yeah, many many different types of choreography they introduce. So I really want to emphasize the practical dramaturg. My my dramaturg colleague make a new concept every day. It's like uh, physical drama truth, and then sometimes hands-on drama truth. So they all the concepts relate to the practice. So my practice is like just make one piece. It's a good piece, rather than we rather just think about how can I enlarge the choreography and also enlarge the dramaturgy activity. So now I'm working on this that kind of type of drama tree, very right? the performative like drama tree. So thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. So just to take up last one being Kesan, but just to take up Charlene's uh, talk about or rather notion about glossaries, I think it is time that we have to tackle that because the amount of uh, terminology or description uh, from slow dramaturgy to descent dramaturgy to now we have and then there was a term that was used uh, for Genesis uh, project with the workshop abstract dramaturgy I think was used uh, by Arco right so it, there is I think is it I think there is a need to have actually this kind of glossary where we ex it's not so much like uh, what Shalin said about a dictionary but rather just what are the terms that are going that are circulating amongst our practices? Right. Are we good to go? Great. Please. Uh, just a reminder that I'm the last one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, hello. My name is Kay Saito. I'm a freelance producer, and I have uh, actually never worked under the title of a dramaturg, uh, nor have I ever spoken in a session on dramaturgy. However, uh, I would like to talk about how I have discovered dramaturgy in my work. Uh, mostly as a producer. Okay. I'm originally from Tokyo, but I uh, moved to Totori, which is the western part of Japan, a uh, prefecture with the least population in Japan, and I moved there in 2006. And until the, uh, the end of 2016, I worked for Bird Theatre Company, which also ran a theatre space called Bird Theatre, which is in the photo, which is a, an old kindergarten building and also a school gymnasium. Uh, it's in a small town called Shikano, which is part of Totori Prefecture, and where there's uh, annual festivals happening every year. And then after I uh, left Berset's company, I was still living in Totori. Um, the company was originally based in Tokyo and then moved to Totori uh, in 2006, well, to find a place. And in today's uh, this newspaper, which is called Nikkei Shibun, it's a national newspaper, there's actually a big article uh, which is titled, uh, Theatre Artists Are Leaving Tokyo. And this movement of kind of decentralization was actually, uh, I think from my point of view, accelerated by the earthquake and the nuclear incident in 2011. So we're actually, well, you, you could say we were the first ones to actually do that. However, yeah, yeah. Um, I have always felt that during my work at Bird Theatre, uh, dramaturgy was something that's not relevant to my work at Bird Theatre. Partly because, or mostly because, the director of the company was someone who liked to dominate the rehearsal room and never really acknowledged that he would need anyone's help to construct a drama. <laughs> Is it funny? Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Yet, as I was looking back my career for this presentation, I kind of rediscovered that the dramaturgy was present in the place uh, where we encounter the audience. Uh, in the cases of Japanese uh, site-specific works, which are produced, uh, sorry, introduced yesterday uh, in yesterday's sessions, uh, it was said that artists and works intervened into the local community. But in the case of Bird Theatre, although many of us came from outside Totori, we based ourselves in that community and were very much connected to local community, both as a theatre professionals but also as residents too. And our relationship with the local community as theatre practitioners was built as we constructed the relationship with the audience. So the place like this and then um, uh, the place was for the local audience to come and suspend their daily life to exp experience something different. 
So everyone living in Tottori, well, we could say that, whether they are what you call theatre goers or not, was potentially our audience, even though they had not come to the theatre yet. So I guess you could say that there was a kind of a German theatre of the space and attached to this place that was in the photo. Okay. But it was only uh, last year, uh, through different works that I experienced as a freelance producer, that I became really aware of uh, dramaturgy and a kind of dramaturgical moments in creation. So I'll give you two examples of my experience, uh, one of which hasn't got photos. Uh, I have worked for an international collaboration work presented at APAF, which is, uh, stands for Asian Performing Arts Forum in Tokyo, as a Japanese English uh, interpreter. This work was directed by a Chinese director called Wang Chong, or Chong Wang, uh, with one actor from Philippines, one actor from Thailand, and three Japanese actors with different skills of English language. And then it took a while for me to work out exactly why my, what my role was as an uh, interpreter, but uh, as I wasn't really keeping myself busy like I normally am as a producer. So uh, then that made me kind of distance myself from the work. And uh, I began to look at the structure work and I also began to understand when the director needed someone to step in as a dramaturg. And the second experience, then in November last year, I worked for Asian Contemporary Dance Festival in Shinagata area of Kobe, uh, organized by Dancebox. And during the festival, I had a chance to work for the creation of a piece called Steeping Life by a director, Jun Tutsui, in which, uh, which also was a part of the project called About Dances in Shinagata. The work focused on the lives of Koreans living in Shinagata area and tried to recreate the ritual called Chesa, which is to calm the spirit of those who passed away. So uh, all the foods and singing, everything was uh, recreated on a stage. And my position there was best described as a production manager. Uh, I, I did things like I contacted people to interview, arranged the rehearsals and meetings with taken good crews and organized Korean cooking classes and karaoke lessons. <laughs> but none of those jobs were particularly new to me, of course, uh, but uh, it was very con connected to how the work will be shaped. And every those practical choices it seemed like a dramaturgical in a way. And I think it was this, this, uh, this was because the director was very open to the discussion and also that he was patient enough to wait for the, those ingredients to develop into something more concrete. And like how Bao Tseta is in Totori, uh, this work could not be done without the presence of dance box in the community of Shinnagata. Okay? So just quickly, two more things about the uh, uh, things to relate to dramaturgy that I came up with. And after becoming uh, freelance, one of the things that I set as my own aim, a goal, to, was just to see more shows simply. Because uh, before that, the number of shows that I see in a year was very few. Then I also tried to make myself articulate what I thought and what I felt about each piece with my own words. I'm not a critic, so I don't write those things on uh, social media or whatever. But I thought that was a very important training for me. And this was triggered when I met some Australians and uh, British producers uh, during a festival last year, and they questioned the honesty of the Japanese audience and of me. Uh, we discussed things like whether it, it is appropriate to stand up and leave the venue during the show if you don't like the performance. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I'm not very confident in making aesthetical judgments about work. So if everyone's talking about oh, how bad work was, then I feel a bit hesitant to say something positive. But I have uh, heard people saying to me, oh, the work must be either good or bad. <laughs> or uh, people's, if it's people from the Europe or America, and they say they, they often associate these kind of attitudes with the modesty or politeness of Japanese culture. Yet I feel making honest sounding comments is far from dram dramaturgical and simply not interesting. Rather, I think we should question if there's really such a thing as honest feeling or, or thought towards our work. And I'm also very reminded that experiencing or Appreciating a work of performance arts is very much communal and collective one. And the question of leaving your seat during the show must be looked at from this perspective uh, rather than treating as a moral question. Mm. Okay. And lastly, uh, very uh, fragmented, but uh, dramaturgy in children's theatre. I'm not a specialist in children's theatre, but we have made and presented some works at Bird Theatre, which is for children. And I have been quite curious how children receive their, their theatrical, ex theatrical experiences, uh, as my eight-year-old daughter has always refused to see any performance, and she sat, she sat through a whole show for the first time only last year. 
and also had a chance to work for Children's Theatre Festival in Okinawa uh, last year, which is a Rika Rika Festival, a great festival, and was strongly reminded how important it is for so-called children's shows to have a dramaturgy. I saw some excellent works which had a clear structure and a drama, even if it's non-verbal performance, yet at the same time, some other works, in, in some other works, the dramaturgy was overlooked. Okay. So these were my fragmented thoughts and discoveries about dramaturgy, and I hope to find out more in this session. And very lastly, like Yoshiji, I'm a member of OnPAM, which is an open network of management in, in Japan. And then we had a satellite meeting like you have here in uh, Singapore in, uh, at Centre 42. Uh, in September last year. And I'm also, OMPAM is a window organization for APP, or some of you might have, Asian Producers Platform, okay, which is going on for the last four years. So I'm just saying that if there's things to talk about network, I have a few things to say as well. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, food for thought. All six presenters with very different views, but there are some clear uh, threads running through it, one being audience, audience reception, audience perception even. Uh, the other one being then the conception of dramaturgy in its uh, very focused social-cultural and social-political uh, milieu where they all come from. Um, very quickly now, I'm just going to open up to the audience for discussion. Uh, we have six presenters. If you have a question, please let us know who you would like to direct the question to or if it's open to anyone, yeah? Comments even, please. Do we? Yes, we have one. Well, uh, I, I am Knuto Varnsen, a professor of theater studies at the University of Bergen in Norway. We had an intervention here yesterday in an open meeting. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. So, no, I, I'm listening very interested to your uh, discourses and I find the notion of dramaturgy as you deal with it here uh, very interesting. It's a very open way of, uh, of defining, of uh, dealing with that, dramat that concept which comes from Germany originally. Mm -hmm. and, but there's something more I want to say also regarding this historiographical perspective of why it's difficult to present uh, uh, Asian theatre in Europe, and this uh, uh, historiographical explanatory model that, that you presented, Yoshi, Yoko Yama, uh, I, I, I found it very interesting as a, as a perspective that you presented. Uh, that I think uh, uh, you forget a little bit about romanticism. Uh, about romantic, the romantic period, romanticism, uh, yeah. Yeah, which influenced exactly at the end of that decade which you described entered into European theatre from Germany, into French acting, the, the pre-romantic, the, 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 the search for emotional expression in the art of acting, and not only the oratorial persuading. So that came also from Goethe and, and, that, and Schiller, and that changed the whole perspective. And that also opened up to, uh, uh, to later uh, re-theatricalization of European theatre at the time when, when Japanese theater was looking for, for the European realistic theater, inspired by Ibsen. And, and, and then, so there was a great exchange uh, with uh, the other way around. So a great interest, G. William Jades, for instance, in, uh, of, of Japanese theater. So I, I just want to question a little bit your model of explaining uh, this. Was, you added some, some economical facts like uh, that the culture has to correspond to, uh, to, to, you, to economic superpower situation, uh, which uh, uh, very interesting uh, as a model, but, uh, uh, but as I see it from my perspective, uh, uh, there was a great interest in Asian theater at the beginning of the 20th century yes. in Europe. Uh, and and uh, uh, that this interest should have been, should have gone away or, well, uh, I, it, your perspectives of the difficulties doesn't really, com uh, uh, com doesn't really co convey my impression. I, 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 this, therefore, I, 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 I ask for a deeper ex ex uh, explain uh, explain uh, uh, way of explaining this. Uh, what, do, do you really think that there's, there is these economical forces that decide the interest for each other? Europe versus Asia or East Asia? 
period? Well, I, 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 presently, yes, yes, yes. Because, because you presented a, a historical model, a historiographical model, which I, I saw was very concentrated on the 18th century and not taking in account in, uh, what happened later. And that uh, true, well, I mean, the concept of Orientalism may be an explanatory factor here. Uh, it was a great uh, 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 interest for uh, for for uh, for uh, Orient for uh, uh, much inspiration from from, from especially Indian uh, dramaturgy, the, the Hindu the, the, uh, dramaturgy, but there was also a great interest for Siami, and and your and the Japanese tradition, which came express, uh, especially to expression with Udin Theater and Eugenio Barba, and all these reversing. Well, that, it was also a kind of disinterest in in, uh, in in the European tradition because one one thought that the rhetoric tradition was only uh, an, an, a persuading tradition and not uh, an emotional or not a dancing. It has changed a lot. Uh, uh, so, uh, but but I think you speak, spoke specifically about festivals like Festival d'Avignon, but you you but. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, maybe that imperialism came in between and destroyed a little bit uh, the interest and that exotism replaced orientalism and, and that, that just to deepen a little bit your attempt of historiographically explaining it but uh, I think no and that's probably your point that it has opened up to a great exchange hasn't it or, or am I wrong? Is, is still your impression that is a very weak interest for Asian theatre in Europe? Just as a rhetorical question. So, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, so, uh, just uh, f at, at first, I, I have to tell you that, you know, even in, in, in Europe, the musical theatre was always uh, 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 more popular than the speaking theatre. I, I mean, you know, often you, you, you were talking about uh, the romantic theatre, but uh, in the in the 19th uh, century, the me melodrama was more popular than <laughs> romantic theater. You know, so what, what the question was that you know the speaking theater was not really popular. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, um, if, if if you want, if you if you come to theater, you you want to see something extraordinary, extra extraordinary, <laughs> so something uh, different from the, the everyday life. You know. So, in, in general, uh, opera or melodrama or and, and musical drama or dancing, something, dance, ballet, something like that, they are more, more popular. So, the, 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 the thing is that, you know, uh, what is uh, quite strange in the European theater history is that they, they invented this unpopular genre. Uh, um, so they, they made it some, something quite popular. But we, we, and, and in Asia, we, we, we have to we had to adopt it uh, to, to be kind of to be human beings, <laughs> to, to be modern, to be uh, civilized pe people. So um, so it was a kind of um, a marking of of knowledge in this in this uh, culture. But so. Uh, what, so what, and the, the, the next, next question is uh, uh, why and, and, and was it uh, is there any Asian influence on the modern theater? Is that <laughs> the modern European theater? Is that so? Um, so and in the it's it's true that since the um, 19th century uh, there were more than more um, Asian. Uh, theaters interest in in, in Europe, uh, and uh, so now uh, when we talk about uh, post-dramatic theater, uh, often yeah we 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 uh, yeah we, we also talk about the influence of a Asian theater, but often um, I think um, for the dramaturgy um, even. For so-called uh, post-dramatic theater, uh, we are too much based on the uh, so-called modern uh, drama concept. I mean, a drama as a script. 
I, I, we, we, uh, we have a t tendency to, uh, to, to reduce um, a performing arts experience in the kind of script, I mean. So it's, it's not so, so easy to, um, to, to be free from this uh, modern drama concept. But you know, uh, the, the notion itself of drama uh, it, it, it was meaning uh, an action, you know, and, and drama is um, from, uh, from a drum and, and in, in Greek, and it means uh, do something, do something, it's, it's, it's a deed. It's not a word, you know. So I have to, uh, I think that we have to uh, rebuild the notion of drama uh, from uh, this original meaning. Yes, can I comment on that? Uh, of course, the speaking drama was very dominant in the European tradition. Uh, but, but from the beginning of the 20th century, one tried to get away from it. And today, with also uh, the, the visual dramaturge, the post-traumatic theater, of course, and not the least the director's theater, the she theater, uh, new ways of dealing with the classics has, uh, has taken the better of the situation. So, uh, so it's not that more, uh, and I think that's also your point. So we are Greek, probably, but when you said that uh, uh, that one in Asia had to adapt the, the European uh, spoken theater as a way of being civilized, and I, I, I wonder a little bit about that, uh, because when I was in China in a conference, I was told that uh, we had to get away from feudalism by, by taking away over uh, Dancing and opera tradition, so it was not. It was from the. It was from the inside. Maybe the situation in Japan was different. Uh, uh, maybe the, the, these explanatory dimensions are different in Japan and China. In China, but my impression from China was that it came from inside, not from. An, but maybe it was a kind of uh, beginning European dominance and uh, many factors that that was uh, contributing to this. Uh, uh, so, but I can, and, and in China now they are very preoccupied with how to combine the opera traditions and, and dancing theater with the European drama, or, or Chinese modern drama. So, uh, isn't that a little bit the same here that you try to use your traditions? You want to reinvent kabuki and no, like uh, if you think of Robert Wilson, who was extremely inspired, inspired, inspired by no theater to create this stylization of postmodern postmodernity. Money influences also came uh, uh, to, to, to the Western theater from Japan via uh, that kind of tendencies of using the historical stylized forms in postmodernity, like also the Baroque European was used, reinvented. Thank you so much for uh, the, your, your thoughts on it. I, I'm going to play a bit of an executive here and say that I think in summation, especially with Yoshiji-san, what he presented was probably kernels of his own theorization, especially with your research, and then it's also pegged on to a PhD. In all fairness, what we've asked him to do is to present his entire thesis in five minutes, right? I think that we need a longer period, and for the interest of maybe some other people who may want to ask questions, perhaps this could be taken up during coffee break, and I'd like to just uh, ask permission to move on. Uh, are there any questions uh, for or comments about what we've seen today? There is quite a bit here, and I, I myself would like to start a conversation or, or on a question to Janice, if no one would like to pick up something. Janice, I'm very sorry, but this is, to me, it was, I was curious when you said that you do dramaturg yourself. How does that work? I, I, I grapple with that. I do grapple, I do struggle with that. Uh, and, and there's always been a mean, the question when theatre directors say, of course I, I, I believe in dramaturgy, I don't have a dramaturg, that's because I actively dramaturg it myself. Discuss, defend. Yes. Uh, when I when I say I dramaturg myself, uh, okay, it happens both when I'm writing and when, when, while I'm directing. So when I'm writing, 
I already thinking about you remember I, I when I talk about my vision or yes. how I think about dramaturgy. The four pil your pillars of yes, <laughs> my pillars. And so when I'm writing uh, my play or my script, uh, I'm already thinking about con contextualization. I'm already thinking about this play is going to develop a discourse in tackling some social issues that I want to address. Say, for example, I, uh, one of my plays is talking about the medical system in Hong Kong, where the, um, the family members will be asked to make a decision for, uh, dying, for our dying family members, whether we want the doctors to stop uh, healing or st stop the medi medication for, mm -hmm. for our family members. And it usually happens for elderly, that is our parents. And, and so I interviewed a lot of people who experienced it, and we found it very ridiculous that uh, uh, the family members were put into that situation. Mm. And so, but we, we don't know how to um, change the system, the medical system, and we don't know how to address this in uh, public or uh, in terms of policy, you know, that kind of thing. So I wrote a play. And I use um, Michel Foucault. Mm -hmm. uh, he spoke about the birth of a clinic yes. mm -hmm. and uh, about clinical gaze. And I put that um, philosophy uh, or his, um, yeah, his theory into the play. And then I, um, when I wrote the play, I already thought about how the process, I mean the experience of the audience, is going to... Um, help them or support them uh, or give them some power to confront such a situation right. when they go back to the reality. And actually, I, well, to my surprise, like in the very first scene when it was performed, already there are a lot of uh, audience crying. I really hear them crying, sobbing in the audience and until the end of the show. And, and some of the audience um, uh, feedback that um, they feel um, they were healed because they experienced the same thing and they make a decision for their parents to stop the medication. And they feel so guilty that they've, as if they've murdered their parents. But after the show, after the, like, uh, the, the, um, yeah, was, uh, this, um, the discussion of the siblings basically in the play, and they feel like, okay, I'm not alone. And, and I can see how these siblings in the play make decisions and they, how they discuss about whether to choose, uh, uh, how to make that decision for their dying father. And also I've uh, invited um, um, Sam Taylor as the musician, basically. So he's the character, character in the play and he's also the musician in the play. And there's also sound healing in the process. So, so there are lots of things going on right. when I'm writing the play. So that's how I uh, describe it as I'm my, my own dramaturg. And it also happens when, when I direct uh, productions. Yeah, if that makes sense. Actually, yes, it does. The, I was just curious about how then precisely that the final details of what you mean by dramaturging yourself. Whereas this is something that you've set up uh, frameworks of context, of certain kind of uh, performance narrative that you want to see coming out of this written text, right? So yeah, so it's very specific dramatical elements that you're looking at. Yeah, and actually uh, you asked about social intervention, right? Yeah. Uh, I have to say it's coming out of my journalistic background and it's also coming out of the current situation in Hong Kong where the uh, journalism, I, I mean, the role of journalism or journalists is um, kind of diminishing. Uh, I, I don't want to say too much about it, but, but that's the situ uh, situation. And for me, as a previous journalist, I feel really um, powerlessness, powerless to, to the current situation. And then I think, okay, can I do something, I mean, some journalism, in theater, and like as if like each play is an investigative report, say like this uh, uh, about the medical system. I really I wrote the play as if I'm doing an investigative journalism, uh, uh, writing a report in the newspaper, and so basically after that play, 
uh, at the performance, uh, there are a lot of discussions going on about um, this process, how the doctors uh, uh, discuss with the family. And there are some publications uh, out, uh, not by me, but, but it, uh, it's part of the discussion of the current uh, medical si uh, system on how to um, like terminate uh, some, someone's life, basically. Yeah. Thank you. So it's all about research and context oh. for you. These are two big pillars of dramaturgy, obviously. Thank you so much. I think we have time for perhaps one more, quickly, if anyone. Everyone is either still processing because we've had a lot to talk about. There's one over there. Could we just get the mic going? Hi, uh, I'm Gennan Duarte from the Philippines. Uh, I would just like to ask the dramaturgs, um, the problem, uh, to contextualize, in the Philippines, the notion of dramaturgy is um, new. Uh, very new. In fact, not all directors know how to quite to handle the presence of the dramaturg in the rehearsal space. Uh, from the negative standpoint, it's because uh, directors do not have the training to, to, com uh, to communicate and to uh, collaborate with dramaturgs. But on a positive standpoint, it's because for the longest time, since dramaturgy was not introduced, directors and actors have been, and playwrights have been forced to, as uh, Madame said, to dramaturg their own. So, would you be able to give tips on how slowly we can inject the presence of the dramaturg within the creative practice of, uh, of the rehearsal space? Uh, just thoughts on how possibly we can start bridging the gap between the directors who are used to dictating the artistic practice and the dramaturg who actually is there to help them improve their craft and not to attack their egos. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'm quickly going to respond and then I would like someone else to respond or, or quite a few of you. Uh, I hear what you're saying. Oops. I hear what you're saying very quickly. The fact that you mentioned that you want to slowly insinuate to bring in this dramaturg to dismantle dictatorship. For me, that suggests then the director is already not ready to have the figure of the dramaturg. There is, no, there is not even a negotiation anymore. There shouldn't be a discussion. Because if the director says, I would like to work with the dramaturg, but actually I must be in control, I feel then, let's not even start the discussion, for one. Yeah? Uh, and many of us have actually experienced that where directors or choreographers say, I'm very curious about this role of the dramaturg. And then straight away they actually say, but I don't want them to interfere. The mere act of dramaturging starts with intervention. It starts with uh, an injection of something to, uh, 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 new, different, provocative. David Pleasure, uh, in our last previous session, talked about using the analogy of a virus, a computer virus. The dramaturg is a computer virus, or the dramaturgy itself. Dramaturgy is a concept. It's a computer virus that's inserted into an operating system that disrupts it. And then within that disruption, hopefully that system opens up and creates a new system or it finds a path into a new system, into a better system even. Anyone else, please? I'd like to... Um... Well, there are several things. I also would like to defend directors who don't want to work with dramaturgs. Um, only because I think yeah. we need to speak up for... One, it is their practice. And with any practice, it is grown through time, and the artist has decided that this is the way that I want to work. Whether it's the dictates of funding or dictates of institution that installs a dramaturg there, then you know, he, has to negotiate, or he or she has to negotiate with it. If a, if a director doesn't want to work with a dramaturg and doesn't feel the need to do so, then he or she should just not. Right? But if he and she is willing to open up to negotiate, and even though it is taking the person out of his or her own comfort zone or whatever you want to call it, and I think this is where you need to select or find a dramaturg, and this is one of the dramaturg skills, people skills. Know when to disappear, know when to appear, like the perfect shop assistant, right, who suddenly knows when you need and shows up 
and just disappears when he or she is not wanted. And to one of the things about training to be a dramaturg that has nothing to do with dramaturgy or the dramaturgical is this level of people skills and a level of sensitivity. And I go back to what uh, I talked about, what Charlene talked about when she went into a rehearsal, where should I sit, what should I say? Those are the things that he or she needs to be very, very mindful of and how not to really upset. So this is where the dramaturg being from on the outside and constantly standing on the outside and looking in is truly quite important. And I find great difficulty, and this is just me, reconciling how uh, a person can direct and dramaturg at the same time unless he and she can really step out of the situation. It's not really out of himself or out of the situation. So I think really it is about that training of the dramaturg in terms of the people skills and the interaction skills and having that sensitivity to know. But that's from me. Anybody else wants to respond? Anybody would like to yes. weigh in? Thank you. And then we'll go. Um, I actually think that, uh, I guess it's a little bit different in theatre, but in dance, as long as the choreographer is actually on the outside, is not on stage themselves, mm -hmm. um, in, in many cases, it is possible to dramaturge yourself. Oh, you're going back to Genesis. Point. Yeah, right. just, just to sort of uh, continue the conversation of that. where it, it, Because you're not on stage, you have the ability to um, objectively look at what you're making what, one after the other and to be able to say if this works or not. And still be able to question. Um, of course, it's way more difficult, which a lot of people tend to do and doesn't work. Um, every time, but I think it is a conscious, conscious decision or a mm. choice that everyone should have yeah. and not something that you sort of uh, force people into. Thank you. We'll go. Um, I think also, um, if, you, if you introduce a little bit of anarchy, then it's good. Like, uh, <laughs> in a sense that, in a sense that um, it's anarchy also to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to the field itself. That's what I'm trying to say. Like, um, like uh, we are all already, the example is very much structured within the way that we think about profession and, and, and job distribution and, um, and, and coming from Indonesia, like the, the whole history of the, the presence of ghosting dramaturg is precisely happened because they are all in an amateurish setting, like theatre sai and theatre kubur in Indonesia. They, 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 they allow dramaturg to develop and dramaturgy to develop. Though there are still a hierarchy back in the 80s, but it introduced a kind of uh, 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 reconstructions of the, uh, not only the functions of the dramaturg, but also the director and actors. So what, what is the role of actors within the improvisation setting, for instance? What is the role of uh, director? What is the role of technical directors? And so on and so forth. And if we allow that to happen, and this is probably best happen um, in, a, in a collective setting, um, then I don't think it will be a, a, a problem. I mean, like, think about it like an underground band rather than a company. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you very much for staying for this session. Please put your hands together for six speakers again. Thank you very much. Uh, we will continue with our next session back at the main area uh, at 2 p.m. And it's a very exciting one. I wish you would tell more of your friends to come. Uh, it's arts and leadership, and we have a very, very special panel, and one being Hiromi herself will be pres present to speak. Yeah. yeah? So please uh, come and join us again at 2 p.m. Thank you very much.